Welcome back to the show, everybody. We got a good one for you today. Coinbase going public, submitting to S1. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about James Wallace, the VP of Ripple X. We're going to talk about uh, Brad Garlinghouse and hear from him. We're going to hear from Hester Purse. And we're also going to hear from Brian Brooks and his time at the OCC. And I'm interested for you to tell me what you think. All of this really points to, because I'm going to tell you what I think. Let's roll that beautiful intro. Here we go. This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Backup Bradley Above at the top of the screen and everything that we're talking about here today. Let's go ahead and get down into this right now. So this is from the Crypto Caveman. Coinbase pre-IPO share appreciates following the S1 filing with the SEC. This was a confidential IPO filing. So uh, this should be, uh, by definition, a shorter run. Like, you know, the date has not been determined yet. It will be to, deter- to be determined. But... Uh, uh, I don't anticipate it taking as long as the normal process because it was a con- confidential filing uh, from the jump. So it should be a shorter period. We should hear something pretty quickly about when that actually rolls out public. So we'll keep an eye on it. Now, full disclosure, let's go ahead and listen to this quick clip here from CNBC. It's only the first 50 seconds, I believe. But let's listen to just some of the numbers on Coinbase and let's talk about this article real quick. Meantime, uh, we have some news just out crossing uh, Coinbase, the cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, Let's get to Leslie Picker, who's got the details. Leslie. Hey, Andrew. Yeah, they filed their S-1 this morning for a direct listing date TBD. Uh, But some really fascinating uh, details in this filing. Uh, They showed that revenue in 2020 increased about 136 percent uh, over a billion dollars in revenue. So more than doubling in 2020, most of that revenue stemming from transaction fees. Also net income positive showing in 2020, 322 million dollars in net income. Uh, they said that they had 43 million retail users, 7,000 institutions uh, on their cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, other details about the transaction, they will be uh, debuting with two classes of stocks set to list on the NASDAQ. Uh, the- and that was about it right there. It set the list two different types of uh, classes of stock on the NASDAQ. Well, like I said, it's to be determined. We will check that out. But let's go to this article again really quickly here because it shows that uh, the the cost of the shares right now have increased. Coinbase's S1 filing with the Securities Exchange Commission for a direct listing on NASDAQ uh, okay, so it was a direct listing. I don't think it was a confidential IPO. So maybe I was wrong about that. I'll go back and double check. But even a direct listing is more direct than a regular IPO process. So even still, I think we are going to hear, uh, regardless of my misspeak, I think we're still going to hear uh, rather quickly on that. So we'll keep an eye on it. But here it says... Um, for the direct listing on NASDAQ it is now public. As a result, the price of the company's pre-IPO shares on FTX increased from $390 a share to above $430 a share within hours. Whoa. The exchange has experienced immense growth since its inception nine years ago, accruing a customer base of $43 million. You know the rest of the numbers. Revenue soared to $3.4 billion. There it is. Coinbase was on this. It was on link to, which I show quite often because this is the companies, the picks and shovels behind the tech. And that's why I show these things because one link to is really great company and I love them to death and they have amazing products. I mean, right now they're replenishing because they're going so quickly. If you're an accredited investor, make sure you download this app and watch out for more because it is flying off the shelf, especially now that we see Coinbase get such a high business valuation and knowing that they've announced they got the S1 filing, things are heating up. And that's the other large thing I wanted to point out here. Mainstream media is covering it. The more we see these massive companies in this space begin to take that step to go public. Oh my, oh my. This is what I'm seeing where now you're going to get the awareness of the conventional traditional markets and investors to a really, really large degree where they're going to start putting their money in this space and look out. (laughs) Yeah, I can only imagine what 24 months, 36 months from this moment now 
looks like. I would, I'm an eternal optimist, so I'm going to go ahead and, and just project that we have some kind of uniform framework, and I hope that that's the case. Uh, but if we do, and I do think we're going to get that sooner rather than later, I, I just can't imagine how enormous this market would be in another 24, 36 months. All right, let's move on here because where I want to go next is stay with me on this. I want to give you a reel of clips and information on a person here. And I want to get your feedback on this because this looks like a certain narrative coming to the surface and it's not coming from YouTubers. It's not coming from podcasters. It's not coming from crypto uh, investors and maxis. I want you to check this out. Do you remember this when we heard Brad Garlinghouse say back in November of 2020 that the uh, central banks were looking to issue stable coins off of the XRP ledger? Listen to this very quick clip right here. I mean, certainly we do know of central banks looking at the XRP ledger as open source technology to issue stable coins using the XRP ledger. Bingo. He goes on to say that they don't even have to contact us. We're there if they need us and they want our help, we'll help them. And if they don't, it's open source technology. They can go on and develop what they want off of it themselves. That's why it's open source. Okay. This is James Wallace. James Wallace is currently the vice president of Ripple X. He deals with central bank engagement, okay, for CBDCs. Looking at his experience, like I said, vice president, central bank engagements and CBDCs. He's full time. He's not part time. This ain't nights and weekends. This is what he's doing every day at Ripple X. He's helping to onboard and engage central banks about launching their CBDCs, which are their own issued stable coins off of the XRP ledger open source technology, as Brad Garlinghouse said. OK. All right. Stay with me. Well, this is James Wallace talking just a handful of days ago on the Voice of Fintech. Shout out to James Wallace and Voice of Fintech for this clip. I want you to listen very carefully what he says. And, you know, Ripple's trying to work, you know, as, as I mentioned, both with central banks and, you know, commercial banks to build our solutions out. You know, specifically around CBDCs, there are really three things that we're we're trying to do. You know, one is uh, the core ledger, if you like. So the, the the technology that is used to mint or create the CBDCs and then distribute it and track the transactions, you know, on, of the systems of record, if you like, on, on the on the blockchain. And you know, we have a clear view that you know, a private a private instance of an existing de decentralized ledger. Uh, is a good way to go, right? And what I mean by that is you take the all the really robust um, experience of, you know, an open source project that's built a ledger that's been running for multiple years, like like the XRP ledger. For Notice he just said a, a ledger really that's been running for multiple years. It's proven out is what he's talking about. Listen what he says next. Example. Um and then you create a version that is a bit more centrally controlled that a central bank can be comfortable with uh, running and, and that they will be able to still control their monetary policy and so forth. So that's the first step, right, is the actual basic ledger. Well, there you have it. And he just said it, didn't he? To create a version a bit more centrally controlled for central banks so central banks could be more could be comfortable with and running and they will still be able to control monetary policy with did you hear that this is what we're talking about talking about building a private ledger on top of the xrp ledger open source technology mm -hmm. yeah that's what he said and building it in such a way that it doesn't challenge and gives the banks and the central banks around the world the ability to control their own monetary policy. They already know whatever they're going to call this asset, whether it's a currency or a security or a frisbee, skateboard, hula hoop, I don't give a damn what you call it.
They already know the way that they position it to their clients. However, they all are agreeing in the back room when they're talking about using it, when they're having these conversations with central banks, they have made it abundantly clear that whatever the designation is, it will not interfere with your ability to control monetary policy on your central bank digital currency. How about them apples? How about them apples? Well, that's not all. Remember this, when Brian Brooks was at the OCC, this was back in October of 2020, listen to this notion about a private ledger that we just heard James Wallace talk about with central banks. Listen here what Brian Brooks said back in October as some of the ideas they're kicking around in the break room. There are a bunch of solutions that I've heard people talk about on this. One would be imagine a world where there was a central government blockchain and all other chains sort of connected to it. And (laughs) oh, this isn't a podcaster. That's the former head of the entire United States of America federally chartered banking system. That's who that is. Now, listen to this, because this is Hester Peirce, crypto mom. At the SEC, a chairman, one of the five votes at the chairman there, if I remember correctly, it's a panel of five when they vote on something. I want you to listen to her tell you what the problem is and what cryptocurrencies really are really for here. Digital currencies really can be a very useful way for people to to transact with one another in a way that eliminates some of the friction that might exist, for example, of having to um, deal with one currency in one country and another currency in another country. If you enable people um, a way to transact with one another in a currency that both of them can then take and and convert into their own currency, that can be quite efficient. Digital. And there you have it. And that's a market regulator at the SEC telling you the real usefulness, the real benefit here, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, is that a digital currency could be used back in between two actual currencies, between two countries, right? Well, doesn't that sound a lot like what Brian Brooks said in that in that statement? Doesn't that sound a lot like uh, what Brad Garlinghouse was talking about with central banks looking to issue stable coins and off of the XRP ledger, open source technology, leaning into that they've built a private network on top of that open source technology that he made sure to highlight. And then James Wallace, the VP, telling you as well that they create a version of a little bit more centrally controlled to make central banks more comfortable with the idea of running their own network and having the control of it. And they will still be able to control the monetary policy. Again, highlighting the real nature and threat here. If we collectively as central banks decide to uh, take advantage of this XRP ledger open source technology and the native asset XRP to settle back in between all of these things, what is the guarantee and the and the uh, the guarantee that as countries and our sovereign currencies will never be challenged, that our monetary policy will never be imposed upon because we have decided to bless you with the volume of our country's business and payments during the course of a day? Because that's where the value is truly going to come from for XRP is from the volume of payments, which is utility moving on to the network. And there isn't a bank on this earth or a government to boot that is going to agree to give you their volume, their utility, and let you get the price to the moon and then turn around and crush the dollar of our country. That's not going to happen. That dog doesn't hunt. And if you want to know the real truth, I can tell you that I believe that's why we have a lawsuit with the SEC against Ripple. It isn't because they frauded anyone. It's not because they did anything illicit. In fact, the lawsuit doesn't have that in it. It's just about the fact that they believe that they are an unregistered security. And by the way... 
Gary Gensler believes it's a non-compliant security. Now, I don't know if that's split in hairs, but those are his words. So I tell you what, I don't know where this goes. But one thing I do lean into is I'm leaning in just as much as the big boys are leaning in. Because Brad Garlinghouse is leaning in, James Wallace is leaning in, and now I'm leaning in too. It's not financial advice, but that's where I'm at on this day. Everything runs on the ledger. Don't believe it. It still may be true. I got to go. That's going to do it for me. Hit the like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Make sure you share with somebody you know. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Make sure you check out all the links in the description box and the comment section. There's some really great products and services in there of things that I use each and every day. You may find something for yourself. And there's some really great specials, so make sure you really check those out. And they are vetted, trusted links. I'll catch all of you on the next one. Thank you.